start. It's uh, 3 o'clock. I want to start on time. Uh, others will join us um, along the way. I really want to focus on starting on time and being on time. So um, help yourself to whatever food and beverages are at the table and we'll begin. Um, my colleague Matt Lesser is out sick today, um, so he can't join us. I'll be uh, chairing the meeting with Jan Park, uh, the director of the Planning Council and the governmental co-chair. And today is Thursday, April 27, 2017. Uh, let's begin today with a moment of silence. Uh, this is a tradition that the Planning Council has had since its inception. It's uh, a moment that all of us stop for a second. Um, to reflect upon the work that we do, we uh, honor those who we've lost to AIDS and those who are struggling and living with HIV and service providers in the community that provide services to people with HIV. Um, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the passing of a friend, um, Gilbert Baker. He was the creator of the rainbow flag. And for LGBTQ people, that is a symbol that is used um, to acknowledge um, our struggles, um, not only here in the United States, but around the world. Um, it's amazing how a simple idea like that can resonate in such a powerful political way. Um, for those others who we've lost to AIDS or HIV, feel free to um, use this opportunity, this moment, to acknowledge them as well. Thank you. Uh, let's go around of introductions. I'll begin on my left, David. I'm Dan Klaus from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Planning Council staff. Um, Paul Carr, um, Consumer Planning Council in Manhattan. Randall Bruce from somewhere else. Maria Diaz, uh, Planning Council Consumer Committee member and Tri County Co Chair. Andy Strauss, uh, Pine County Co-Chair and Hudson Valley Community Services. Jen Budis, the Family Center, PSRA. Faye Barrett, Needs Assessment Committee member. Karen Davis, uh, Co-Chair Needs Assessment Committee. John Edwards, Needs Institute. Becky Fenton, DHS. Claire Simon, Needs Institute. Lou Smith, Cal Lord, PSRE. Graham Herman, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Ronnie Cockrell, Census Plan for Healthy Living. Lisa Zulik, Down Slow We Deliver, IOC Co Chair. Zach Pettensee, IOC Wyckoff Heights Medical Center. Christina Rodriguez, High Department of Health. Lucia Torian from the Health Department here for moral support for Christina. This is not her first meeting, but I thought I'd come along with her. Uh, Monique Wright, uh, Mental Hygiene. Melody Lawrence, Planning Council. Daryl Young, Planning Council staff. Joe Corpus Sierra, Paul Rutarian. And on the phone we have. Oh, John Chef, we have a super
around the world to talk about these mics. And we have a number of core activities, and one of them is to gather data 
that providers and laboratories are mandated by the state to report that includes positive HIV test results, viral load and CD4 tests, and genotypes. And we collect it into an electronic HIV registry called EHARS. And at this point, we have about 240,000 people in this registry, although about half are no longer alive. And I'll walk you through a little bit of the process. So using myself as an example, say I go to a nearest city provider and I get an HIV test that's sent to a lab. The lab finds that the test result is positive. That's sent to New York State first, which assigns it an ID, and then they see that the provider was in New York City, so then they send it back to the city health department. At the New York City Health Department, they look in the registry and see, are, is there already a Christina Rodriguez heart in the registry? Am I a match to somebody there? And if I am, then they'll just update the record of the new lab. If I'm not, then they'll assign me for field investigation as a possible new HIV case. That's a good question. Uh, he asked, what about people who home test? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I can go back and People who home test are not reported to the health department because they are not a laboratory and they're not a, a clinical provider the way you all are. Nevertheless, we, we encourage them to link to care and if they go to a care provider and the care provider for the most part will have as its protocol a retesting a, a retest so that they can confirm the diagnosis and, and then proceed with the care, then those diagnoses will, will be reported. But home test people are not reported. They are encouraged by the counselor who gives them their test results from the, the laboratory and the, or the organization that is, is managing the home testing. They are encouraged to link to care and they are given information about linkage to care. But we are dependent on either a laboratory or a, a diagnosing provider here in the city. And that wouldn't be a private citizen. For those who home test, um, say for example they home test and they get a positive result. Um, do we know from the industry how frequent it is that the person that receives positive uh, results then goes to a provider? Do they, is there any way of having an understanding of that process? There is not at present, but we are currently working on getting a and on, on getting data from the home test providers that would allow us to, to do that kind of matching and analyze that, how frequently people get into care. It's a tremendous concern for everyone. We believe that it is a huge advantage for people to be able to test at home privately, but what they, the, the disadvantage is that they don't have somebody to do the immediate post-test counseling for them. It, but there, there, there is a relationship there, but it is by telephone, and it, it is considered to be not as ideal as, as we would like, and the linkage to care is, is not always followed through on. Do we have data? The answer is that was a long, a long answer to that means no, but we are working on, on getting that from the, from the manufacturer. Okay, so this is a snapshot of 2015 HIV outcomes of interest. So in 2015, we had nearly 2,500 individuals newly diagnosed with HIV in New York City. And that's the lowest number on record since we began collecting HIV diagnosis data in 2001. Of these, 18% were concurrent with an AIDS diagnosis. So that means that within 31 days of them being newly diagnosed with HIV, they were also diagnosed with AIDS, and it's an indication of the proportion that were diagnosed quite late in the stage of illness. By the end of 2015, we estimate that about 82,500 individuals were living with HIV AIDS in New York City. And you might see that this is a different number that's what, than what is in the annual surveillance report, which is about 122,000. And that's because the 122,000 is everyone who's ever been diagnosed in New York City who we believe is still alive 
but who may or may not still be living in New York City at this point. The 82,500 is anyone ever diagnosed in New York City who we believe to be still alive and who we also believe to still be living in New York City as through some sort of evidence of them engaging in care. In 2015, there were 1,307 AIDS diagnoses and 1,678 deaths among people living with HIV AIDS. Christina, can you, can you speak to um, just the history of the epidemic and at the height of the epidemic, how many people were being diagnosed? I think about how many people were being diagnosed and how many people were dying in a given year? Jan, you see it on the graph and you notice that right away. There were 12,000 diagnoses in 1992, which was our peak year. And our peak year for deaths was with 8,000 deaths, and that's 94, 95. But the fact that we're now have uh, looking at 2,500 diagnoses a year is a, a very significant improvement. We still have many miles to go in ending the epidemic, which is what everybody's here committed to doing. But we certainly have, have been through a very dramatic history. Right. I, I just point that out as a point of comparison. So there was a year when almost 1,000 people a month on average were being diagnosed. And, and look at where we are today. So there, there's very positive hope in continuing to bend that curve and, and to bring those numbers down. We have many, many more tools than we did during that period of time. For those of you who are living in the 1990s and the 1980s, it was a desperate and hopeless time. And to be able to sit here today and see the advances that have occurred in our field is just truly remarkable and amazing. Happen because people sat idly by. And, uh, you know, Lucia and many others in the health department continue to report the data and deliver it to meetings like this and, and um, keep the issue alive and urgent on everyone's agenda. And today is no, no time for us to be any less complacent uh, than, than as diligent as we may have been in the 90s. Because we can't in this epidemic. And as you see the, this chart, you see the curve going down. We're heading in the right direction, but that doesn't happen without a lot of effort and energy, both in prevention and in treatment. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to be grandstanding <laughs> right. the presentation. No, you're, you're giving my, my slide for me, so. I always look at, I look at these charts and I just say there's a story there. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a really wonderful story because it looks, you see something that looks like Mount Everest. And when you look at the perinatal transmission curve, it's like a Dairy Queen ice cream cone, right? It goes up and it comes down. That's where we want it to go. But speaking of bending the curve, the curve that we want to continue in the right direction are the blue bars that continue to go up. That's everybody here who's living with HIV and AIDS. We want everybody with HIV and AIDS to live a long and fruitful and productive and happy life and healthy life. And in many of the long-term cohorts, like Max and the Swiss cohort and the Cascade cohort, people with HIV and AIDS are living as long as the general population. And this is a, a, another wonderful milestone that we're reaching. And one of the reasons why, why the health department is so committed to getting people linked to care, engaged in care, and keeping them in care is that that is, at least at present, our key to keeping everybody with HIV and AIDS alive and well. Okay, I'll, I have a I'll move on. To Can I just ask a quick question? Oh. So what is the relationship between new diagnoses and new infections? Are they, are they defined as the same thing? No, they are not. So can you, um, can you make the distinction for us between the diagnosis mm -hmm. versus the new infections? Because certainly in terms of ending the epidemic, um, the number of 3,000 new infections a year to bring that down to 750 has been the goal. So I see 20 under 2,500 new diagnoses, and I'm just wondering what relationship does that have to new infections? So as everybody in this room knows, the HIV has an acute period during which most people are not diagnosed. For example, just 10% of our new diagnoses in 2015 were diagnosed in the acute stage. The acute stage of HIV 
in, is like the acute state, like the prodrome of most viral illnesses. Illnesses. There's sore throat. There are muscle aches and pains. Joint, joint pains. Sore throat, cough, fever, nausea, swollen glands. It's very similar to the flu, for example, and it is misdiagnosed by many physicians. And uh, only 50% of people that are in the seroconversion stage actually exhibit these symptoms. So 50% symptomatic, acute HIV infection is missed for the most part. It is, like most flu, self-limited. So if the doctor tells you to go home and get lots of rest and eat soup and, and drink plenty of fluid, and you'll, if you're not better in a week, call me. You're going to be better in a week. And then HIV lies quiet in your, in your body doing many bad things that are not, are, are, are not immediately clinically obvious. And then if you are the average individual, you are going to progress to AIDS at around 10 years. Some people progress earlier, some people progress later. So when we have a new diagnosis of HIV, we don't know whether you've been infected for six months or you've been infected for 10 years. It could be anywhere on that spectrum. Christina just said that 1,300 people last year were diagnosed at the same time, and that's the wrong number. But there are a number of people that are diagnosed with HIV, with HIV and AIDS within the same month, meaning they've already progressed to, they've, they've already had their 10 years. We have a way of, of estimating incidence that involves something that you may be familiar with called the detuned, a version of the detuned assay, where we look at your antibody titer and your antibody binding capacity on the theory, proven, that if you've been infected for more than five or six months, your antibodies are going to bind more tightly to HIV antigens, and your antibody titers are going to be higher. This method of testing was worked out over a very long period of time at CDC and by a number of other laboratories. And we use that with a statistical method to estimate incidence. And last year, you can see in, in your annual report, where is it on page 10, that our estimated incidence in, in, in New York City last year was 1,700 people, 1,696. So that's lower than the number of new infections which on an annual basis makes plenty of sense because not everybody, not everybody is diagnosed uh, immediately after, after he or she was infected. Is that helpful? I actually, Does that answer your question? I just wanted to hear you say that one more time, that um, if somebody was infected for five to six months about the binding, they didn't get all that, but that was really interesting. That, that your, your antibodies early in infection don't have the same binding capacity as they do when, you're when your infection has been established more. And this algorithm has been worked out. It's called STARS, Serologic Testing Algorithm for Recent HIV Seroconversion, has been worked out to make that window period, so to speak. Everybody remember that term? That window period to be 583 days, 153 to 183 days. And it, it measures your, your IgG and your IgM, your immunoglobulins that are produced early in infection versus the immunoglobulins that bespeak a more, a later, more established infection. <coughs> and again, these results are never valid on an individual basis. They're worked out for populations because there's a lot of false positive and false negative. And CDC is going to be abandoning this method at the end of this year and using the, the, the slope of CD4 decline in the population to estimate, estimate the time, the difference between the time you were infected and the time that you were diagnosed. Okay, so speaking of that, um, here is the HIV care continuum for 2015 overall. And overall, 74% achieved viral suppression. And the continuum is our approximation of how well we're doing getting people tested, engaged in care, prescribed HIV treatment, and then helping them achieve viral suppression. Now, some subpopulations don't have quite as high numbers as this. For example, among youth, which we define as individuals ages 13 to 29, 
62% uh, have viral suppression as compared to the 74% for people overall. <coughs> How do these numbers compare to the national averages of viral suppression? We'll get back to you on that. Our numbers are always better than the national numbers because we have complete viral load and CD4 reporting and we have what we believe is one of the highest performing surveillance systems in the country. There are many other high performing surveillance systems, but CDC has two burdens on it when it tries to calculate viral suppression. One is incomplete laboratory reporting from the various states and, and cities, and the other is the difficulty of deduplicating diagnoses. Thank you, Alicia. Um, Graham, do you want to speak to viral suppression among runway clients? Uh, excuse me, viral suppression around the runway clients is a little bit lower. Um, for I can't, I couldn't tell it to you off the top of my head. But when you, our care continuum looks different for the runway um, population because we're starting with everyone being diagnosed. So we have a different way of looking at it. Um, but the population of Ryan Mike clients tends to be um, more retained in care and slightly less virally suppressed. Thank you. There was a question. No, I was just going to say I, I sit on the board of the Care Coalition and I saw a report that showed that uh, people living with HIV who were receiving Ryan White services nationally were um, had an 83% rate of viral load suppression and that that was significantly higher than uh, people living with HIV who were not receiving prime white services. And, um, you know, it's not attributable to a specific prime white service, but I think overall the national uh, HIV service delivery system supported by the Ryan White programs across the country has generated improved health outcomes for people living with HIV, far superior to the national average, particularly amongst people who do not receive Ryan White services. So I just wanted to share that. Okay, great. Could I ask, so you were mentioning that not all populations achieve these outcomes. Could you speak a little more to that, including people of color or other populations that maybe as a group we should be more focused on? Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned youth. Um, another group that uh, you see a, a drop in in terms of viral suppression is uh, transgender individuals. So I was going to show a slide on that later on when I talk more specifically about transgender individuals. Um, Lucian will probably correct me. I think that in terms of Latinos, um, I think they have comparable numbers to these. Um, I think African Americans might be slightly lower, but I, to be very sure about that, I would need to go back and check those numbers. So you can find these in on page eight of your annual report that Christina passed out a few minutes ago. There are differences in linkage to care and viral suppression by race and ethnicity and by risk factor, by gender, and as Christina already mentioned, used as a, it is, is, it is the group which we see has the lowest viral suppression in, and this is among people that are in care, so that if we include also those who are not in care, which it, depending on the analysis can be a significant number, we're assuming that if you're not in care, that you're not receiving your viral, your prescription for your antiretroviral therapy and that you will have a challenge suppressing your virus. But if you can see these, it's the, it's the pea green graphs at the bottom of the page. And you can see that there are quite, there are differences by race and ethnicity and differences, as Christina pointed out, by age definitely differences by transmission risk and some slight differences in, in between the two cisgender genders and then a lower rate of viral suppression in the in transgender. And I just looked at CDC's continuum and there, in answer to your question, Jan, their viral suppression rate is 30%. This is a 
graph for the past five years of timely initiation of care among people newly diagnosed in New York City. And we define timely initiation of care as having your first CD4 or viral load test within about three months of your diagnosis. And so over the past five years, this has increased slightly by about 5%. But this is the number for people overall. Um, there are a number of subpopulations where these numbers are lower, and that includes transgender individuals, black people, people living in their 20s, people who inject drugs, MSM who inject drugs, and actually people born in the US in comparison to those in a foreign war. I think it would be interesting to compare. Now, this is from all people living with HIV in New York City. It would be interesting to compare this to people in our RAN white programs to see if there's any uh, difference. Is this, is this a statistical difference? Jan, this is actually people who are newly diagnosed oh, in 2015. Okay. It's not PLWHA because we're looking at linkage to care within 90 days. And by the way, the federal standard is now changed to 30 days. And the state standard is linkage to care within three days if you have co-located medical care in your organization, your CBO or your hospital or whatever, and if you do not, you have five days to get the patient in care. So the bar is being set higher and higher and higher. Why is that? If the data are very clear that if you get somebody who is newly diagnosed, not necessarily newly infected, newly infected even better, but if you get somebody who is newly diagnosed and the person's CD4 count is still high and you get them right on antiretroviral therapy, you have a far better clinical outcome than if there is delayed therapy. If you get somebody who's acutely HIV infected on antiretroviral therapy during that period, this is somebody who hasn't even produced antibodies yet, you can sometimes almost subvert the entire humoral immune system so that you don't get antibodies ever because there's never enough viral antigen stimulating the production of antibodies. So this is a great outcome for somebody who is who is who is acutely infected, but it makes for a diagnostic challenge because then when they try to switch providers, they're going to get an HIV antibody test and not only will they be will their viral load be suppressed, they will be a viremic completely, but they won't have enough antibodies. And I can't tell you how many calls I'm getting about about people like this that were diagnosed with HIV and treated in the acute stage and who have basically shut down because they shut down their, their viral replication, they shut down their antibody production as well. I'm just curious what that means from sort of like a long-term outcome perspective. So if you're one of these people, I mean, obviously you still have HIV, what does that mean for your care, how you present? So the faster you get your viral load down, the longer you're going to live, and the better and the better you're going to live. We don't have decades worth of experience with this because we're not very good at picking people up at acute HIV infection at that stage. But the data on the few studies that have been, have been published are extremely favorable. Can I answer the question, Tess? Um, I just wanted to know, for the three to five, is there anything that, that gives significance to those numbers? You know, why it's not one or why it's not ten? We were just, we were having this conversation because now those are the e hip qual indicators and it just seemed an arbitrary cutoff, so we weren't sure if there was any data that was specific to that time frame. No, I don't know the answer to your question, but I have a feeling that the answer is no. That was my guess, too. That was my guess. <laughs> okay, so um, next slide is um, <laughs> the part of suppression. Within 12 months of diagnosis and within six months of diagnosis for the past five years, um, for individuals overall, and this has steadily been increasing. Uh, viral suppression within six months has increased 74% in the last five years, and we define that as a um, viral load of 200 or fewer copies per milliliter. Can I ask, uh, following up on the, if you catch HIV in the acute state, 
Does it change the drug regimen? Like, do you need less medication in order to suppress the virus, or does it have any impact? Good question, and not known yet. And not known whether you can interrupt at some point. There, there, there is a lot of attention on this, and thinking that maybe if you if you get your if you're amyremic early, can you stop therapy after five years or whatever? The answer is the jury is still out. Question about seventy percent viral load suppression after twelve months. Is that the result of just good medicine, or is that the result of good medicine plus? Um, you know, engagement in care, uh, good providers, um, three visits a year. Do we have any understanding of that? I think not, but I think logically you might say yes. It's good medicine, it's good drugs, number one. Really important. Highly bioavailable, very poor, I mean, very low side effect profile now compared to what it was before. People are taking one, are, are getting four drugs in one pill once a day. Everything has changed and began to change, I think, around 2005 and 2006. Your regimen with HIV was far improved. Doctors in New York have always had a lot of experience in dealing with HIV. They get better every year. But you've got to be in care in order to get your meds, and you've got to be taking your meds. So the answer to your question is, we don't know that logically we would say yes, of course, all those things, all those things feed into it. We're looking at data on viral suppression within, within one and three months right now. It's getting faster and faster. Why is that? Because on March 27, 2012, so almost five years ago, the feds recommended that everybody get on therapy right away, regardless of what your CD4 count was. And so finally it looks like at least some providers in in New York are doing that, and people's viral loads are coming right down very fast. So stay tuned for those those results. They ought to be interesting. So, um, when he says within six or twelve months, that means that that's the measure, that's the period you're measuring every six or twelve months. And in regards to what you said about you know, uh, the one month measurement uh, for a consumer point of view, it usually happens that soon because if you're going to the doctor every month mm, when you're either newly diagnosed or in, put into care. So within the month you already are, you, your viral load has come down. That good the medication is. So I wonder, who, as this in the future, as we make you know, present the data. And what you just said about the month measurement, would this be now a different way of looking at the data here? Sure, everything's changed, and you're absolutely right. That we ought to be looking at one month, three months, six months, nine months, twelve months. Some people are going to come down immediately. Any retroviral therapy, as you say, is that effective, and others will take a little bit of time. Some are also probably going to have a discussion or two with their doctor, so it'll start happening after their second or third visit. So how does that compare when numbers get fluctuated when patients, for those kind of patients that come in and out, there are cases where, you know, when some of them might be cared for, let's say six months, and then something happens to them, and they just stop. So how does that data influence this measure? So then this is, this is time from initiation of care to your first achievement of viral suppression. We don't publish it routinely in this report, but we have presented at CROI several times on whether, and we also have a paper in JAIDS from a couple of years ago on, okay, you achieve viral suppression, can you maintain it for six months, for a year, for two years? And the data are encouraging, but achievement doesn't necessarily mean that you're there and you're going to stay there. So not a, in other words, not everybody, people who achieve viral suppression don't always maintain it. So this, like, this particular graph then does, it's considering those um, patients you have data for, 
but only for that safety so anything else beyond that then will become sort of it's, it's not it's not in that picture it's another picture yeah. we didn't want to see it, as you try you know as we try to create plans for continuous care and find reasons or and numbers to justify where, where things are moved those were numbers would be interesting to see just because the initial numbers which are great for impact but the long term will be most useful at least when you're planning and when we think about people needing to be on therapy for decades decades like five or six decades that's that's where that that is what they would say would be the bottom line so what what we will do is consider seriously what I think you are suggesting, and that is that you'd like to see a suppression maintenance graph in in the annual report as well as an achievement graph. Thank you. Done. Thank you. We need to move on. But there was a gentleman in the audience who had a question. Do you want to use the microphone here? More race by GMAC. <coughs> Suppressed since I've been taking a triple in 2006. And for me, when being suppressed and, and being undetectable build my self-esteem up because I'm able to be accountable and responsible for my well-being. I don't speak for people who are in silence about being undetectable, but I celebrate being undetectable because I'm able to have a better quality of life and be more proactive in my life instead of having a pity party. But basically, I came to the planning council just to really listen and hear and to become a member because I have to be more proactive to see social change in the community. And I thank you for all your constituents and I have a blessed afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. I have another, just a quick question. Yes. About the um, threshold for viral suppression, is less than 200 copies and that has changed in the last five years? Do you think that affected this as well? We, well, as you know, there are many different kits, and yes. we are trying to be as permissive as possible, and of course before we used to use 400, yes. because many of the kits, that was their lower limit of detection. Now the lower limit of detection is very low, and in fact for some of our HIV-2s it's, it's 20. So we're, we're remaining as permissive as we can be. One of the one one of the justifications for that is that we're looking at both your long-term clinical outcome and at the the probability of transmission at various levels of viremia, and you don't really start seeing transmissions. Until and then you see very few until somebody has around 3,500 copies of virus per milliliter. Okay, and uh, and then this is the last kind of overall slide, and this is the number of new diagnoses and the rate of new diagnoses <coughs> in the past five years, which has been steadily declining, and in the past five years it's declined about 26 percent. Now, of course, there are certain subpopulations where this is not declining uh, as quickly or not declining at all, and I'll get into some of that. So I'm going to focus a little bit on MSM and transgender individuals, but you can find more data on our website, not only for these two subpopulations, but also for other ones that I don't have time to cover today. Uh, I'll have links at the end of the slide set for those annual reports, slide sets, as well as surveillance tables. Um, but you can also, if you don't have the links on hand at some point, if you Google our program, HIV Epidemiology and Field Services Program, you'll find all the links to these data sets as well. So when, you're, when you have a question around data, the website is the best first place to go. OK, this is the care continuum for MSM in 2015 overall. And Comparing this to the, the continuum for PLWHAs, it's very similar. The proportion of viral suppressed is 75% for MSM as compared to 74% for PLWHAs. And, uh, Can I ask a question about the footnotes here? Could there be footnotes? Uh, um, the asterisk refers to MSM IVUs. And I know, Lucia, this has been a, in a category that the CDC has 
defined for a long time. <coughs> is there evidence today that MSMs are any more um, subject to injecting drug use than heterosexual populations? And is there a heterosexual IBU category? The answer to your first question is no. And the answer to your section, second question is, if you are, an, if IDU is your transmission risk, and you are not also documented as an MSM, you get classified as IDU without regard to whatever your sexual practices are or your sexual partners. So as everybody in this room knows very well, risk factor ascertainment is extremely difficult until the field services unit began to interview patients. We had only what the doctor recorded in the medical record, and it was quite incomplete in, in most instances. I think our ascertainment of IDU was probably better than our ascertainment of any sexual risk factor, whatever the practice was, and whatever, whoever the partners were. But that is an impression over um, several decades of, of doing surveillance and reading charts and looking at the outcome. But no, we, we, do, we do not. So the continuum is high, but what's more concerning for MSM is the disproportionate impact of new diagnoses. And this is the new number of new diagnoses by transmission risk group for the past five years. And we see that there have been declines for all transmission risk groups, but MSM remains still disproportionately impacted. In 2015, they accounted for 58% of new diagnoses. And the second highest group actually in 2015 is this unknown, and um, some of those might be MSM as well. We don't know. So this disproportionate rate of infection among men who have sex with men is, uh, this is just New York City. Nationally, what do those numbers look like? Is this a heterosexual disease today as opposed to a gay disease? That's what once was in the past. <clears throat> That's terminology that we generally don't use, but you are allowed to use it. The majority of the, the largest group that is affected by new HIV infections is MSM, nationwide as well as here in the city. And among MSM, the, the largest proportion is attributed to Hispanic and Latino MSM. I just say that in response to stigma and stigma that is attached to MSM and HIV. And although we've worked very hard to bring that uh, stigma uh, people to a greater understanding of how HIV is transmitted, it still seems that when we look at these numbers that this is a, this is a disproportionate population of people being affected here in the U.S. Globally, it's a whole different story. And when you're meeting with elected officials and you're advocating for PEPFAR funds or you're advocating for Ryan White funds, it's, it's a, a very mixed conversation that you have with electeds. And for, for very good reason. The epidemics are quite different in Africa and Asia than they are in Europe and the United States. First of all, we have a subtype B epidemic here in Western Europe. That is not the case in Eastern Europe and certainly not the case in the Middle East and in Africa, most of the African continent, and in, in, in Asia. And there are some data suggesting that heterosexual transmission is much more efficient with some of the non-B subtypes, like A and C in the community recombinant forms. But there should be a different conversation with PEPFAR than there is for U.S. prevention and for care and treatment because we have different epidemics. And you know how they say that all politics is local. All epidemics are local as well. And whether the local is your whole country or your city or your neighborhood, we have some neighborhoods that are much more heavily affected by HIV than others in the city. And again, you know those maps by heart by now. And so that, that 
the, the local funding and the local effort and the local outreach and the, the local services would all have to be based on what's happening with the epidemiology that's local. Yeah, and I, I would just add in, in continents like Africa, which are considered more heterosexual mm -hmm. epidemics, MSM are still disproportionately impacted, um, even in those places, even though m most people there are got it through heterosexual transmission overall. Christina, may I interrupt you for just a moment? Jen, you asked a few minutes ago about heterosexual versus MSM IDU. And you, I might refer to you, and I could send you a copy of this paper that was written by Don Desjardins, probably in 2008 or 2009, that hypothesized that most transmission among IDU, because it was so close to the rate of heterosexual transmission that we saw here in the city, was probably sexual transmission and not due to using not, not due to sharing contaminated equipment. Okay, so here we have um, new HIV diagnosis in the past five years broken down by age group among young MSM, so MSM ages 13 to 29. Since 2007, the young MSM have accounted for more than 50% of new diagnosis. And in the past five years, new diagnosis among both young MSM and MSM 30 years and older have declined. In this graph, we see that MSM 24 years of age and younger have had their numbers decline, whereas the number of new diagnoses among MSM 25 to 29 has not declined. It's remained relatively stable. And this is a breakdown of numbers of new HIV diagnoses in the past five years among MSM by race and ethnicity. And what we see is that the numbers have been declining for black and white MSM, but it remains stable for Latino MSM, and they are now the group with the highest number of diagnoses. Yep. Um, concerning you know, the population of Latino Hispanic, is there uh, perhaps a data in which that population is sort of, uh, you can see the divisions, whether it be from either they're the immigrant Latinos or they are the born Lat American Latinos, mm -hmm. do you have sort of seen or have you know, distribution? So we have country of origin for for everybody in surveillance that we were able to obtain it for, and that is dependent on whether it's in the medical record or whether our field services unit <coughs> and they're doing partner notification asked and, and, and understood. We do not have anything about their legal status here in, the, in this country, but we do have where people were born or where, where they recently came from, and we could certainly produce data for you. The reason is because sometimes, whether it be medical forms or um, even when the slot is designated Latino, a lot of Latinos, they're born here, they will connect to the to their parents nationality. So the, the slot may say Latino, but and they might have okay maybe uh, Venezuela or Rican, but that doesn't mean that they come from Puerto Rico. It just means that they might have some cultural connection. And they just want to fill that slot because the Latino gets further identified from what magic, but they were born here. So there's a distinction that it's difficult that, you know, you should be aware that the information can be not reliable in that sense. Mm -hmm. And just because we're, you know, when you're trying to coordinate care, there's truly a distinction between those who are born outside, yeah, educated here, or those who are born here, or those who are immigrants in legal or non legal status. So it's just, and that sort of indicates how care is distributed, for example, in areas like in Queens or Corona or uh, Jamaica, which is very oriented to Central Americans. And maybe they, they have, you know, again, it's how do you assign care when diff in Queens, there's so many poor uh, neighborhoods. 
in which how the, when you go to the hospital you might say, well, I'm from Venezuela. But what? Are you born here, but your culture is Venezuela? Or, you know, you're, or, or are you an immigrant or are you a resident? So all those things become difficult as to trying to um, bring people to care and try to find methods and ways to attract them. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, this is not one of my slides, but um, we do in the full MSM slide set, there's a little bit more information on foreign-born populations. And um, when you look at those that were diagnosed or were foreign-born, three-quarters of them were from Latin America. Um, and you can see a breakdown by region as well. Okay, so here um, is a graph of new diagnosis among MSM, and here we're intersecting race, ethnicity with age group. And so we see a slightly different pattern by each race, ethnicity group. Um, the first three colored bars are those individuals under 30 years old, and then the last blue bar is the 30 plus group. And there's a bit of a generation gap, so those under 30 the new diagnoses are predominantly among black and Latino MSM. For those that are 30 and older, the diagnoses are mostly among Latino and white MSM. And overall, <coughs> Latino MSM 30 years and older had the highest number of new diagnoses in 2015. What, uh, sorry, so what is driving that? Yeah. Uh, what is driving what exactly? Like, how are they, how, how are they giving, like, a okay, break? Okay, Marcel, and, and you shouldn't introduce yourself, because you know. Oh. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom. Nice to meet you. Um, I just want to know, <laughs> 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 uh, student committee, I just want to know, okay, if the numbers have increased with the men, with men over 30, right? But how exactly are they attracting you? Like, how are they being diagnosed? Like, are they out there sleeping with men? Are they out there doing drugs? Like, how is that, you know? Like, I just want to know, how are they going about you know, as far as like getting, you know, going about it. Like, you know, because I feel there's a lot of neighborhoods out here that like, they don't, they're not really educated more when they get diagnosed and then they're scared, or, you know, about family-wise and stuff like that, especially um, Hispanic culture because, you know, religious and stuff like that. So how do we, how can we decrease it, and, you know, especially in their barrels like the Bronx and stuff like that because they don't have that many healthcare centers or more awareness of, you know, what to do. Like there's no way of like, you know, I don't know, like, um, well, I'm uh, sure I'm trying to give a, a better answer than me. I'll just say that the next slide does have to do with the neighborhoods. Um, and actually, some of these neighborhoods that have predominantly Latino and black populations are also the neighborhoods where people have the highest levels of testing. Um, so it's not necessarily just that people are not getting tested or not getting access to care. It's been pointed out, stigma is a huge issue. Um, Poverty also it, um, is very high in these neighborhoods with high diagnosis, um, language barriers, other religion may be a factor as well. Lucia, did you want to add to that? I think we don't know. We have a lot of data in surveillance. It is mostly quite shallow and demographic. What's going on with people's thoughts and what's in their hearts and and what they're afraid of and what they feel confident of, those, those are matters that surveillance doesn't touch. What we do is we see the outcome, but we, we, we don't understand what, what some of the, the drivers of the outcomes are. We understand them in very broad brush strokes, but not some of the detail. One thing that I would say, however, though, is that we, we have associations with poverty. We have associations with age. We have associations with race and ethnicity. It's something beyond the traditional notion of access to care. Because care here isn't a matter of not having enough money or resources. And there are designated aid centers, some, some of them multiple, in every neighborhood that is highly affected by HIV. And that includes the poorest neighborhoods in the city. There is care. There is Medicaid coverage. It's the best in the country. There is ADAP coverage. So it is something else. It's something else that's driving that we don't that we don't capture in surveillance. And these are really important questions that surveillance can answer. Thank you. Uh, Paul, you have a question? Yeah. 
Um, well, it was really more, is it, you're not capturing it or they're not telling you? When we're, we're taking, uh, in the surveillance, when we're getting the, accumulating the data with the new cases. I mean, I'm looking at the map, um, and this is not scientific, and I'll tell you right now, but I can relate this to looking at the different communities and where they are, and you know, knowing who it is. These are people who are what, at the highest risk of 30 plus years, I mean, who are not highest risk, who are being infected of new cases of 30 plus. At that age, you couldn't know at this point, in this day and age, as to how to protect yourself from HIV. And looking at the map, it's higher, you know, um, I just see more high risk white, not all white, but they're engaging in what um, obviously unprotected um, behavior. If that's what, what I'm seeing or what I'm looking at now. I see people shaking their heads, so I don't really Yeah, know. I mean, I, I think the number of studies have shown that people of color are not engaging in higher risk behavior than white people are. There are other factors like if you are generally having sex with other people of color and your community already has a baseline high level of HIV, then just the chances of, on any encounter are higher. So I think network factors are also a huge issue. So? Yeah. Recently at the, the Corona Clinic, uh, STD Clinic, well, they're not called that anymore, sorry. <laughs> That's a refrain for calling them that. <laughs> Um, one of the discussions was the outreach for the Latino population. And one of the things that were discussed is the cultural relationship of Latinos to healthcare. And what's striking with the numbers that you showed for a population is 30, 30 plus and for 2015. Uh, it reminds me that a lot, a lot of, the young, of the young men who is their Latinos, and they are not from the population who was born here, educated here, or has a concept of healthcare here. Uh, if those numbers don't, don't state so, but uh, I always have wondered that there will be a spike of this nature when we are dealing with a population of men who, who have immigrated here legally or illegally, and whose concept of healthcare is entirely different. Being male, uh, most healthcare outside the United States is nationalized, they have a different approach to it. And so if these men come in to care, they might not understand the system and the concept of healthcare here. They have, they come with a, con a diff very different concept of healthcare. And uh, as to what you're saying, it is it's strange that today, we, you know, we have um, outreach that goes to, to you know, to festivals, to, you know, all over in Queens, especially. And why are we, I'm surprised to see this number for 2015, despite for 30 plus, when we imagine this adult males are a little bit more informed or educated. But I think, again, from that discussion we had at the Queens Clinic, there is a different, there's no acknowledgement of the difference of concept of healthcare for this type of population men. They have a very different approach to healthcare. Uh, women have a different approach because they get care through maternal care, so they sort of understand the system. But men, Latinos, whether they be immigrant or non-immigrant, illegal or legal, they have and has, and we have seen that in Queens, very difficult approach to healthcare. Thank you, Saul. Okay, uh, Freddie, we're, I just want to do a time check here. It's 4.05 and we have uh, a lot left on our agenda. But Freddie and then uh, Right, it is a comment that when we, I think that we need to be careful when we say that our neighborhoods with the highest rates of uh, HIV diagnosis, because I'm wondering if it is just because we are doing a lot of more testing in this area, and not in Queens, I'm going back to Souls in Queens because we've been going to Queens, and uh, I think that it would be a disservice to dismiss the other neighborhood just because we don't test it. We all know that in Manhattan, in the Chelsea, Clayton, and the Dallas Kitchen area, we have testing facilities, and many residents from other counties are coming to those clinics to be tested. So um, I think that probably it will be important to include the seat of residents 
Right, and right, because I know Queens, and I agree with Saul in there, is a total, total, uh, untested territory, uh, even with the redundancy. And we are seeing many individuals who are between 18 and 25, who are getting diagnosed. Not many, but few of them, more than I would like to see, are getting diagnosed with uh, HIV. So just to keep that in mind, when we say the I mean, when I go to my neighborhood, I, I, I joke, but it's not joking. They said, in my zip code, it, it's safe for you to have sex because we don't have too, too many prevalence of STDs of HIV. And there's a total, a total, and disturbance in the community, so we have to be careful when we present this information. Thank you. Those maps are residents and di uh, diagnosed residents at the time of diagnosis, not the, not the, zip code where the diagnosing provider was. We have other maps like that, but this is residents at the time of diagnosis. So if you give your true address and zip code, <coughs> you're going to end up being in this map. Okay, Katrina, and then we, uh, we have our state partners who are on the phone and they're preparing to give their presentation. So Christina, here's will be the last question before we conclude this uh, part of the um, mine actually isn't too long. I think the one comment was if you look at this map, you could put an overdose map over here. You could put a poverty map on top of this map. You could put a low literacy map over here, right? It's the same heat map for pretty much every social justice issue that we're experiencing in New York City, right? It's more unsafe in Mock Haven than it is in Williamsburg. Um, so I think, you know, we're still looking at sort of like the intersection of all these other factors playing in, and I think it is to Feeding into that, I was looking back um, at kind of the ET dashboard when we were going over this, and it's like if you look back at 2013, it was, we thought we had found 87% of people who were diagnosed. And then for 2014, we thought it was like 92%. And then this year, we're at 94% of finding the people who aren't diagnosed. So I, you know, this testing isn't in vain, and we are going into the right areas, and we are finding the right people, and we are spending the money in the right way. And I think it's, you know, really valuable to kind of get this kind of surveillance data back. But yes, there's obviously a lot more work we have to do in a number of priority populations. But it's also nice to see that we're getting stuff done. And so that's, I just wanted to say thank you guys, because I think it's a really good takeaway out of all this information. Thank you, Katrina. Travis, are you there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you hold on a few minutes? Hello? Can you hold on a few minutes? Oh, sure, yeah. Great, thanks. We're almost finished with the first presentation. <laughs> okay, so there's a few more slides, and I'll just say that um, I have uh, business cards. You can also stop me afterwards and ask me more questions. Um, so there's a few on transgender individuals. Their continuum is similar to that of PLWHAs, except when it comes to viral suppression. There's a big drop there. 67% uh, were virally suppressed in 2015, as compared to 74% among PLWHAs. Although, please keep in mind that also the numbers for transgender individuals overall are, are much lower. Okay, this is new diagnosis amongst transgender individuals by gender and by age group, and what we see for the past five years. And what we see is that it's transgender women in living in their 20s who, have, uh, who are disproportionately impacted. In 2015, amongst transgender individuals diagnosed, 50% were living in their 20s, as compared to 36% for people overall. This is new diagnosis by gender and by race ethnicity. And overwhelmingly, uh, for the past five years at least and beyond, it's been transgender women of color. So 92% <coughs> of uh, individuals diagnosed with transgender were black or Latina. And overall, Latina trans women have the highest number of new diagnoses. I'm sorry, I'm just making a, a quick comment. I know this number, 42, new diagnoses does not seem like a lot, but when you look at the end that it's taken from, we're looking at approximately 300% higher rate of diagnosis than men who have sex with men living in New York City. And we already recognize how high that is. So I just want to put that in context, because the number of transgender people is much smaller. And so, 42 may not seem like a big issue. For the trans community, this is a major crisis. 42 is a 
huge number. Um, okay, so then um, I think this is my last uh, general slide. So this is, again, a map um, shaded by numbers of new diagnosis amongst transgender individuals with those in dark red being the neighborhoods with the highest numbers. In comparison to the map with MSM, there are some neighborhoods that overlap, but there's less of a concentration in Manhattan, and there are more neighborhoods in Brooklyn, in Queens, and the Bronx, which have uh, higher populations of Latino individuals living there. And then uh, this was sent out, but the links to the annual reports, slide sets, and tables are up there. In terms of if you have a data request, it generally takes about two weeks to complete. If the data request is for the planning council, please email that to Daryl Wong. If it is for your, say, your own organization, not for planning council, then please send it to Rebecca Robbins, and her email is up there, and she's in our program. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, we're going to turn our attention now to the Tri-County region, and we have Travis o o O'Donnell here with us on the phone from Albany. And Albany folks have been our friends for quite some time. We're happy to have them here uh, to offer us this data. As you know, the data sets for the counties north of us, uh, surveillance data, EPI data are collected by the state, and uh, this is data that's coming from Albany. Oftentimes, it's difficult for us to compare the two, but we want to present this to you as Tri-County now is very much part of the Planning Council today. So, Travis, go ahead. Okay, thanks, everybody. Thanks to my um, New York City colleagues for setting the stage a little bit. Um, as you may or may not know, New York City and New York State maintain separate um, unlinked surveillance systems. We do routine matching between the two systems, but they are separate. So when we produce numbers, um, sometimes they differ by a little bit. They're pretty close, but uh, if you see something off, a little bit off here and there, that's why. Um, and as this is HIV surveillance data, it subjects to some of the same limitations that uh, my New York City colleagues described for you. So um, also keep that in mind, too. So my name is Travis O'Donnell. I'm the Assistant Director of the Division of Epidemiology Evaluation Partner Services. I'm sorry I can't be there with you today. I'd very much rather present this in person, but I've got um, another commitment in a, in a few minutes. Um, so I do apologize for that. Hopefully you can hear me okay, and um, I, I trust you have the slides in front of you, so I'll get into it a little bit. Um, so I'm just turning the page, looking at um, the, the first slide here. This shows overall newly diagnosed HIV cases for a six-year period, 2010 to 2015, at the state level. And it's broke. You can see it's broken down by New York State, New York City, and rest of state. And really, this is a, is a pretty tremendous success story. We've seen about a 25% decrease in newly diagnosed HIV cases over this, this time period, an average decline of about 5% every year. Between 2014 and 2015, we saw an 8% drop across the state, and that's really just, I think, a testament to all the wonderful work that, the, that all the clinicians, providers, and people living with HIV across the state are doing to end the epidemic. Um, so there was a total of 3,155 newly diagnosed cases across the state, and approximately 75% of them were in New York City, about a quarter of them were in, were in upstate. So looking at slide number three, the next slide, most of the slides that I'm going to show you today kind of show a comparison between the, the, the picture in upstate New York State, so um, all of New York State outside of New York City on the left, and then over on the right we show um, a picture of, of the situation in the lower Hudson region or the tri-county region which encompasses Putnam Rockings in Westchester County. So this first slide, or on slide on, on number three, shows, uh, focuses in on the lower Hudson region, which, uh, again, is made of Westchester Rockings and Putnam. You can see the majority of the burden is in Westchester County. They had about 80% of, of the newly diagnosed cases in the region in 2015, and um, about 80% of the total totally living cases in the region as well. Um, you can see flat or declining new diagnoses in all three counties, which is terrific and largely reflecting the trend we saw on the previous slide. And um, for the first time, I think ever in 2015, the diagnoses fell below 100 in Westchester County, so that's, that's terrific too. 
Uh, moving on to slide number four, this shows new diagnoses by race and ethnicity, comparing the rest of the state on the left to the dry county region on the right. And one thing to notice is how white non-Hispanic persons are the second largest race ethnicity group in terms of new diagnoses in New York State outside of New York City. But in the tri county region, they fell well below both blacks and Hispanics in terms of, of new diagnoses. So in other words, people of color are making up a much larger proportion of new diagnoses in the lower Hudson region. They made up 86% of new diagnoses in 2015 compared to 69% in the rest of the state. I'm moving on to the next slide. We, we saw earlier how new diagnoses dropped pretty significantly in the region, about 20% from 2011 to 2015. However, new diagnoses among women during this time have remained completely stable. So the decline in the region that we've seen has been experienced almost entirely since then. And now, over this five-year period, women in 2011 made up about 25% of new diagnosed cases, whereas now, in 2015, they made up about a third of new, new diagnoses. And moving on to the next slide, this is, this is a slide that's for all of New York State. Um, it's not broken down into a region, so and it shows newly diagnosed HIV cases among transgender persons. And um, I know New York City shows some similar data, so this is one area where the numbers aren't going to match up entirely. Um, so we can see about 340 newly diagnosed cases among transgender persons, even though it was over this time period between 2010 and 2014, which equates to about 2%, a little less than 2% of the total new diagnoses among all gender, genders in the state during this time period. And as, so, as somebody pointed out earlier, the, you know, given, given our understanding of the size of the transgender population, it's a pretty significant percentage. And so it's, just, it's something that we're definitely you know, focusing on with any of the epidemic efforts in the state. Um, the, the, the data around transgender identity in the state surveillance system is considered largely unstable given some lack of certainty in terms of how gender identity information is collected by clinicians in the rest of the state. So things like provider comfort in asking the right gender identity questions, patient comfort in disclosing their gender identity to their provider are all are all sort of unknowns in terms of the rest of the state picture. So these data are, are largely subject to change as we as we learn more and validate the data against other data sources. Okay, moving on to slide seven. This shows newly diagnosed HIV cases by risk group and region. So again, upstate on the left and lower Hudson region on the right. And really one of the great success stories in terms of um, new diagnoses in 2015 has been the large drop in the diagnoses we've seen specifically among men who have sex with men, which historically have had some of the highest numbers of new diagnoses over time. Uh, on, the, uh, on the left side of the screen, you can see new diagnoses among MSM and MSM IDU staying largely flat from 2011 to 2014. But that number dropped about 11% in upstate New York between 2014 and 2015, which is the first time ever we've seen such a dramatic decrease, which I think we saw in, in New York City as well. But you can see in the, uh, in the lower Hudson region, the drop among the new diagnoses among men who have sex with men was even larger at 15%, which is which is just terrific. I'll also point out for you the injection drug user risk group, where numbers in the in both in the rest of state and in the lower Hudson region are relatively low, about 100 cases in the rest of state, about 15 cases in the lower Hudson region. But new new diagnoses among injection drug users have actually dropped about 10% over this five-year period in the rest of the state, while they've stayed level in the lower Hudson region. So that's another risk group that we're keeping our eye on and, and going to enhance efforts to, to drive down new diagnoses. And then turning the page on slide eight, this breaks down, it's distilled on the last slide a little bit by breaking down MSM and MSM IDU by race and ethnicity. And you can see pretty clear how the overall decline in new diagnoses among MSM that I just spoke about in the Tri-County region hasn't been experienced across all race ethnicity, all race ethnicities. And over this time period, new diagnoses among Hispanic MSM actually increased by about a third from 20 new cases to 27 new cases in 2015. So Hispanic MSM is, is definitely a, a, a priority population for, for us, both in the rest of the state and in the Tri-County region as well. And um, 
I apologize because I thought I had included a slide about to, to show you the, um, the continuum of HIV care in the lower Hudson Railway region, but I, I see that I, I just forgot to do it. So what I can say is that the, the outcomes largely mirror the outcomes that we're seeing at the upstate level. And in terms of viral suppression at the end of 2015, 68% of people living with HIV, diagnosed HIV, were virally suppressed at the end of 2015, which is the exact same percentage as um, rest of state in general. And 87% of people with diagnosed HIV who are in care were virally suppressed too, which is, uh, which is uh, a good number and um, it's one that we hope to continue to see increase uh, over, the, over the coming years. So that's what I prepared for you. I'm happy to take, uh, take any questions if people have them. Thank you, Travis. Um, this is Jan Park. I'm the governmental chair of the council. I do have a question, kind of political in nature. Um, as we're all focused on ending the epidemic uh, and seeing uh, the progress that we're making towards uh, achieving the goals of the blueprint, I'm wondering what your opinion is about the future and uh, what we're hearing from Washington with regard to funding for federal programs that support state and city efforts uh, to test and treat people with HIV. And if there's a decline uh, at the federal level in support of those programs, what do you think the future would be with regard to the state's commitment to this and to the city's commitment to this without those dollars? Well, the, uh, since you asked for my opinion, I'll give it. <laughs> Understanding it's just it's in my opinion, and I can't you know I can't speak to to you know the um, certainly the governor's com commitment to to the end of the epidemic to date has been, has been very strong, and you know I I, I, I won't deign to speak for the city's commitment to it, but I know that the city has seen increased resources around any of the epidemic activities as well. Um, the, at the federal level, you know we're involved in a few different group coalitions such as um, NASDAQ, the National Association of State and Territorial Aid Directors, and we have, you know, since we receive funding from, from multiple federal sources, you know, we're in, in constant communication with our project officers and things of, things like that. And in general, you know, folks are being are relatively tight-lipped in terms of the funding picture at the federal level. We haven't gotten any indication that, you know, resources are going to suddenly go away. I think, um, Right now, the, the most the most imminent and important fight that we have right now is the, the future of the Affordable Care Act, which is still very much in the balance. Um, in general, New York State has a pretty good legacy of supporting people with HIV in terms of um, its commitment in the Medicaid program and the ADAP program. And I would hope that any shifts at the federal level would trickle down in those in those programs either. Um, I don't think I've fully answered your question, but I know that you know at the, at the state level that the the institute is as committed as as ever to to ending the epidemic and continuing to 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 fight for resources in in any setting that we can. Yeah, thank you. It, it wasn't a trick question. Um, the the reason I ask is that the numbers are very encouraging to see in in, in the progression and numbers coming down. And I know that this time last year, uh, particularly in the space that we're meeting in at the LGBTQ Center in New York, people were jumping up and down about ending the AIDS uh, campaign and blueprint. And I hope that we can maintain that enthusiasm in spite of um, what we see uh, coming to us from Washington, both financially and uh, more importantly, just um, our own commitments to ending the epidemic. So thank you for the data today. Um, we appreciate you checking in with us and, and providing us a set of data for our tri-county region. And this is new in, in our process that we are uh, uh, also presenting data for a part of our EMA, whereas in the past it was it was not presented in a, in a consistent way as we're doing it is today. So thank you, Travis. Oh, yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Okay, the next item on our agenda, we have to take a vote. So, first of all, we have a quorum, David. Um, 
And so Sharon, do you want to present the spending plan? And this is important because come Friday, hopefully we'll have a budget for this year. We've been operating on an assumption that our funding uh, for this year's grant will be at least the same as last year, if, if not slightly less. Um, but we don't know that yet. And so what Sharon is going to present to you is what our current budget is. And uh, if, if we do find out on Friday or Monday um, that we're receiving less than we thought, how will we manage that? And so that's what we call scenario planning. It's like the best case scenario, the worst case scenario. Um, in this case, <laughs> given uh, the current administration, it's the worst case scenario, and, 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 but it's not as bad as one might think. So Sharon, you want to walk us through that process? Yes, thank you, Jan. So if folks could go into your packets and take out the big budget, everybody has it. So um, the PSRA is recommending that this spending scenario, um, which was approved by uh, both PSRA and the Executive Committee last week, um, You'll see at the very top in uh, column J, it says percent cut to the award. So the total award uh, that's base and MAI together, we're expecting a cut of about 1.7. We figured around just uh, under 2%. And the reason that we figured that is because um, the, the Congress has been doing essentially continuing budget resolutions um, for this year. So our expectation is that there's not going to be a significant change and that if what a continuing resolution is, is that they just fund everything at the same level that it was the year before. Well, um, as you know, there's a portion of the allocation to all the Ryan White programs across the country that is uh, based on uh, formula and because New York has been doing such a great job of decreasing new infections and getting people into care our um, our formula award will actually be a little bit lower um, so we're expecting about 2% so now if you look at column I that is the modifications of carrying costs so um, in column E is a listing of all of the um, service categories that the Ryan White program funding supports. And if you go over to column I, you'll see that there are some changes. The red in parentheses means that there are decreases in um, small decreases in a couple of the categories, uh, medical case management, legal services, of education risk reduction with the largest largest decrease of um, 572,000 for the home and community based services because that's the service category that was eliminated last year. Now, a modification to a carrying cost in the other scenarios is the actual cost of um, running the program over the course of the year. So these programs ended up costing these amounts less. So that totals. Seven hundred and fifty-three thousand three hundred twenty-five, and then we're expecting an additional um, seven hundred and fifty-six thousand dollar cut to comprise the uh, one point five million. Uh, I, I guess to comprise the um, the total cut to the award. So the next thing I want you to look at is column K which is proposed changes to the service categories. So what the PSRA did was we said, if we go back to our state partners and we <coughs> meet with uh, the director of ADAP, Christina Rivera, and we um, requested that the ADAP take what we call an upfront cut to their allocation, which means that we will, in our budget, allocate less money to ADAP. We're doing that in an amount that is equivalent to the amount required to be cut if we receive this uh, under 2% cut to the total award. Um, the reason behind that is in having ADAP shoulder all of the remainder of the cut, it means that 
there will be no change to the other service categories. Um, so we, uh, we discussed this with the ADAP director and the state health department, um, and we thank them both for uh, agreeing to be our partner to supporting us in this and enabling us to create a spending scenario that manages an expected 2% cut without having to reduce the um, allocation to the other service categories. Uh, we've done this in the past. And, um, and then by the end of the year, if there is underspending in other categories, the replenishment of the upfront cost to ADAP is, uh, historically has been the first thing that we have done with those resources. So, um, let me just make sure I covered. So, okay, and then the other thing just to note is that all of the reductions are being taken out of the base portion of the award um, and the allocation to ADAP, which gets both base and MAI funds, is used to balance the base and the MAI portfolio. Any questions? Yes? I know we've done this before, the ADAP thing, um, but can you just remind us, like, what, from their perspective, what's in it for them? What's in it for them is the hope that we replenish them. Um, otherwise, they would be a part of the cut with everybody else. Um, and I think also, I mean, really philosophically, um, for this year, because the cut is of a manageable size, um, the PSRA and the Health Department and uh, PHS, we all were in agreement that it made the most sense uh, to do the upfront cut to ADAP and to preserve the funding levels across the other categories. The other thing is that um, ADEP has significant resources from other funding sources, and the Ryan White contribution is a small proportion of that. So, um, so this does not have a significant impact on their ability to continue to fund the um, prescriptions for people living with HIV across the state. Other questions? The audience? Morris. I think you're being very precise and it's, you know, it's paying Peter to pay Paul. I think the existing resources that you're using and you're allocating is more of using common sense. And I think common sense is the best thing that the <coughs> organization will still be fed by the mother, but it's just being trickled down in another way. That's just mine now. Maurice White. From GMAC. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Maurice. Other comments? Other comments? Okay, can you uh, stay? Yes, so barring none, I would like to propose that the Planning Council um, approve the fiscal year 2017 spending scenario as presented. And I don't think I need a second, right? Because I'm the chair. So okay. since Sharon is the chair of the committee, she's presenting this on behalf of the committee. Uh, the motion does not need to be uh, seconded, but there is a period for discussion. Seeing no discussion, then we'll move to a vote. All in favor, uh, raise your hand, please. Opposed? Then the motion carries. Thank you, Sharon. Again, we don't yeah. know what the final map could be. We'll, we'll know by the time we meet, hopefully we'll know by the time we meet next month. It could be 1.7% reduction, it could be 3% reduction, but we, we voted on a methodology and a way of managing that reduction. Sharon? I just wanted to share two other um, issues that have come up at the PSRA. Um, one is that we had a presentation from um, the housing um, unit uh, from the City Health Department regarding uh, some negative changes that are happening with the HAQA award um, and that it looks like the HAQA, uh, is, HAQA is facing steep cuts due to change in the HAQA formula 
from cumulative AIDS cases to living AIDS cases, and that is going to have a negative impact on the um, HAWA allocation in New York City and, and New York State. So we are um, so that's one area that we uh, are looking at, and then. Um, the other thing, I just wanted to uh, give you a preview. Because of the state of affairs in Washington, and because for really the first time, if anybody has looked at, there are, um, there's a, a federal <coughs> AIDS partners um, analysis of AIDS funding and health funding across the country. And across different categories, and, they, and it, it shows it uh, by showing the, the president's ask the prior year, the, um, the congressional ask, the community ask, and then the um, the president's current budget proposal. And the um, there's often discrepancy between what what the community wants and what Congress wants and what the president wants. But it's in a, it's usually within a couple of million dollars uh, differential for the really for the first time in um, well I've been doing this for over 25 years I've never seen this level of a discrepancy in the hundreds of millions of dollars that the president wants to cut out of domestic health programs. It, it's astonishing. It totals almost a billion dollars in cuts. That's the president's proposal. Um, Congress's proposal is much closer to the community's proposal. And uh, we have to hope that Congress will stand up to the president and say, this is not acceptable and we will not allow it to happen. But, um, but we're not counting on that. So, um, so what that says to us in terms of potential future scenario planning is that there could be uh, potentially some really disastrous cuts that are coming down the pipe to federally funded uh, health programs, including federally funded AIDS programs. And so with that as our lens, um, the historic way that the, our EMA and that the priority setting committee has looked at cuts, which was to say, okay, we'll, we'll distribute them across the entire portfolio in proportionate measure. Well, if you've got a cut of that significant a size, um, sharing the pain across everyone in it almost seems arbitrary. And, and we feel that it is not the appropriate approach and that if we are going to have to have really significant cuts and we're going to have to start to look at the entire portfolio and identify um, the proportion, you know, there are different methodologies. You can say we allocate 30% um, of the award to one category and we're going to reduce that percent to 20%. Or we could say we're going to prioritize categories of service that are direct service to people living with HIV and categories of service that are uh, prevention or are uh, educational, we're going to completely eliminate so that we can preserve more of the direct service component. Um, so there's a variety of approaches, but I think really the point that we want to just highlight for folks is that we're going to be looking um, with a critical eye towards ensuring that the services that we preserve are having the highest impact on improving health outcomes for people living with HIV, and that um, we're going to do our best to, um, to create and sustain a portfolio of services that is going to, um, as best as we can, meet the needs of the HIV community. But we're, um, we're not going to look at it from the traditional lens of across-the-board cuts. We're going to look at it from a much more um, targeted approach. And, um, and that's, the, uh, that's what we're beginning to, um, to tackle. I also uh, want to offer an invitation. If you are interested in learning more about this process, you should feel free to attend the PSRA meetings. Um, and you know, and certainly our advocacy uh, at home with our local representatives to tell them that we need them to stand up for us 
um, in, in the months and the years ahead, I think is something that we're going to need to do more of. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> well, Adrian is here with us. He's going to give us an overview of what's happening in Washington, Albany, and New York City in 10 minutes. Um, hi, I, I'm Adrian Guzman. I'm from the New York City Health Department, the, the HIV Bureau, and I've prepared um, a, a considerable amount of content related to HIV, but I won't go over everything because I know it's, it's uh, the end of the afternoon and I have five minutes. I'm going to tell myself five so I, so I get ten. Um, I do want to hit on two specific points, though. The rest, you can take this home with you to your networks and, and, and share. Uh, but I want to turn to page, uh, the bottom of page three just to talk about some very exciting news in Albany. You've probably heard by now, but back in December, the State Department of Health had published some proposed amendments to the regulation. And the ones for Part 23 adopted, <coughs> uh, I guess it was the last week, it was a week before last. So this means that as of mid-April, right now, in New York State, HIV is classified as a Group B STD. So this has the effect of granting minors the right to HIV prophylaxis and treatment without parental or guardian involvement. Um, so that means PrEP and, and ARVs without having to bring their parents or guardians into the conversation, which could lead to all sorts of uh, issues for, for some young people. The amendments to Part 63, which address a whole array of issues, including sharing HIV data with care coordinators for thinking and retention and care, those haven't been finalized yet, but we will continue to to, to pour over every issue of the New York State Register and let you know when that happens, but hopefully soon. Adrian, yes. On the minor part, I yes. think it's also, if I'm reading the legislation correctly, it's also an obligation that you provide the care um, without the parent's notification through explanation of benefits. So there's an obligation there specific to insurance and billing that I'm not sure people are also aware of. Yeah, an important component. And there's an obligation to, to, to provide or at least refer out um, the, uh, you know, for those settings that don't have the, the means. Um, thank you. Um, then I just want to skip ahead, because I know everybody's probably way more interested in, in the drama that's happening in Washington, D.C. Um, this week, or every week since January, <laughs> I guess. Um, but I'll just skip ahead. I, I include some information on some appointments, federal appointments and confirmations that are of interest to, to HIV advocates and people with HIV, all the way from the Department of Health and Human Services Secretary, uh, CMS, HRSA, CDC, NIH, FDA. Feel free to Google these people and, uh, and, and there's plenty of information out there about whether or not they will be supportive of some of the HIV national agenda items. Uh, so just some more DOJ, HUD, and uh, some White House. So I wanted to focus on healthcare reform very quickly. So as, as you know, back in January, one of the first executive orders that the president issued directed federal agencies to st essentially to start dismantling the ACA, uh, to encourage the development of a free, open market and interstate commerce with offering healthcare services and health insurance. It's a fancy way of saying I have every intention of, of repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act. So in March, you might remember that the House GOP introduced the American Health Care Act, which was its plan uh, seven years in the making in some ways to, to repeal and replace the ACA. So this plan did a lot of things, but most importantly, it eliminated Medicaid as an entitlement. It restricted the ability for states to expand Medicaid. It eliminated the requirement for states to meet essential health benefit requirements, etc. Etc. So there was a lot of back and forth with this. I, I think the week after the, the Congressional Budget Office issued, which is bipartisan, by the way, um, issued a report finding that if this were to pass, yes, it would definitely reduce the federal deficit by $337 billion over 10 years. But the problem is that it would do so by basically gutting Medicaid. And that would leave 24 million more Americans uninsured during that 10 year period. So I just I want to highlight, I should have bold, italicized, underlined the word more. So it's 24 million Americans uninsured in addition to those that, were, that are currently uninsured. So essentially, in 10 years, we would be uh, dealing with 18.6% of Americans without health insurance. 
So thanks to a lot of advocacy, but perhaps by people in this room and across the country, uh, to their elected officials, the drama reached fever pitches, and on March 24th, the Speaker pulled the bill from the House floor. So for now, as we speak, the ACA remains intact, but ever since early April, there have been sources reporting that they were developing a, a compromise bill, some sort of uh, a subsequent bill to, to get all of the fractured GOP together to, to defeat ACA. So that brings us to this week. Earlier this week, Rep Representative MacArthur from New Jersey announced an amendment, which people are dubbing the MacArthur Amendment, which uh, served as a sort of compromise to broker a deal across uh, House GOP officials. And essentially, this amendment would retain a lot of the components of the AHCA, the age-based tax credits, the restrictions on expanding Medicaid, it would keep the tax breaks for high-income persons, but this is, the, this is the change. It would allow states to seek waivers from certain protections afforded by the Affordable Care Act. So these protections included provisions on community health ratings, essential health benefits, and visible risk pools. The, 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 the catch is that in order to obtain a waiver, they have to offer alternatives that would reduce costs, increase enrollment, or strengthen the health insurance marketplace. So anyone can make it sound like their alternatives would do that. And it should also be noted that if, if this were to pass, if, if HHS doesn't deny a state's waiver application within two months, then it's granted automatically. So it's almost like an opt-out system. So what does this mean? So while the bill does explicitly prohibit limiting access to coverage for, for people with pre-existing conditions, critics are claiming that the waivers are still going to do that. They're still going to have that effect. So one example is a state could apply and receive a waiver to uh, prohibit them from requiring insurance companies to charge people with and without pre-existing conditions the same premiums, for example. So now if they obtain the waiver, they'd be free to let companies charge whatever they want. And sure, uh, Presumably that would mean less, but more than likely it means that it's possible for insurance companies to charge people with pre-existing conditions differently than those without pre-existing conditions, probably significantly higher premiums. And as, as, a, as a side note, something like 130 Americans are estimated to have pre-existing conditions, so this affects a significant number of people. Another example is that states with 30 million Oh, did I say 130? No, 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 no. Just a little more than that. 130 million Americans uh, are, are estimated to have the current definition of pre-existing conditions. So this affects a good number of people. Another, another possibility is that if a state applies for and obtains a waiver, they'd be free to define, quote, essential benefits, however they want to do it. So that would mean that they could drop certain components that insurers in their state have to cover. So like maternity care, like like all of the laundry list of, of what Affordable Care Act deemed essential may no longer be deemed essential. So those are two uh, examples of what might happen. Um, so that's that. Uh, I did want to mention, going back to what Sharon, what Sharon mentioned, uh, the president set forth the skinny budget proposal a, a few weeks ago. He proposed $1.6 trillion budget for the next fiscal year, which shifts $54 billion from non-defense programs to defense programs. So as, as Sharon mentioned, this could result in, estimates are all over the place, but most are landing around 18 to 20% cuts for non-defense programs, and that includes HIV prevention, HIV care, all of those programs within the CDC and NIH. But before we can even get to FY 2018, we still haven't settled on a budget for FY 17. So, Right now, the federal government continues to operate under continuing resolution. It's supposed to expire tomorrow. You may have heard that the federal government may experience a shutdown tomorrow. But late, late last night, leaders introduced a short-term continuing resolution bill that extends this for one more week. So we get to do all this all over again next week. Um, so that gives uh, lawmakers another week to try to reach a deal. Um, I, I do want to mention, I just found out on the train, I love the Wi-Fi. Um, I, I just found out that the, the problem was, was that lawmakers were going to sort of jam in the health care amendment into the continuing resolution. So that, in other words, they were telling Democrats, if you want, if you want to avoid a government shutdown uh, by passing this continuing resolution and, and you want another week, then you're going to have to pass the health care amendment I just described. 
And there's all sorts of like loopholes and they absolutely can do that. But I just found out that there was, um, uh, it was through a FAPP, the Federal AIDS Policy Partnership. Someone from each Chicago mentioned they were on a call with the House Minority Whip and they confirmed, to the extent they can confirm something like this, but they confirmed that there would be no health care vote this week or over the weekend, which means that it's very, 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 very unlikely there will be a, a government shutdown tomorrow. We can't speak for next Friday, but um, <laughs> start on the news, read the newspaper, read the blogs, and see, and see what happens next week. But it looks like we're, we're safe now. And they couldn't get the votes for the health care amendment, so it doesn't look like they'll get them in a week either. So I think we're safe for now, whatever that means. And that's it. That was five minutes, right? Thank you, Adrian. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna, it's five. It's four fifty-one, and I want to get Brian. Uh, I'm not trying to see the grantee report. It does not look like we're going to get to the other items on our agenda. And my apologies to the chairs. We'll get this information out to you in an email. Uh, since I want to quickly say that we did have a community briefing on Tuesday, which was very successful. We had a lot of people that attended, and we learned a lot of new things about the struggles that people have who are HIV positive and in homeless situations or partially sheltered. And um, I think that will generate a number of recommendations that will come out of that afternoon, that session. Graham? Thanks, Jim. Uh, the, I'll make the report quick. As we all know, our, award, our full award is still pending, as we were just talking about in terms of the appropriation, appropriation bill. Um, uh, I had an opportunity to hear a presentation from Dr. Laura Cheever the uh, Associate Administrator and Chief Medical Officer of HRSA PAB. Um, and there were some interesting tidbits that I wanted to be sure people heard. Uh, she underlined and underscored their increased focus on supporting the leadership of HIV-positive persons of color, uh, incorporation of peers and community health workers into the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. She also underscored their current efforts to address HIV hepatitis C co-infection um, and their current uh, grant, SPINS grants. Uh, they have five of them. We, we have received one of them, too, uh, which we are naming Project 6C, which I have talked, of, talked about recently. The integrated plans, which were submitted in September, are uh, in process. Uh, the reviews have been completed. We should receive uh, feedback on our integrated plan any moment, so we're looking forward to that. Another thing that she shared in terms of HRSA half measures is the decreasing priority on their retention measure and really looking a lot more closely at linkage and viral load suppression. Uh, she also shared that uh, she wanted to be sure that we were aware that Secretary Price has three uh, health policy uh, areas of interest, those being childhood obesity, the opioid epidemic, and mental health. We submitted our RSR, Ryan White Services Report. Uh, we continue to receive uh, more complete data with, this, with the submission of that report, which is wonderful. Thank you very much, Ryan White providers. We are the, obviously the largest grant in the United States. We have the most data. Um, to submit uh, for the Ryan White Part A program. So this is no small effort, but incredibly important because this is data that's used by Congress. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been an across the system effort to really uh, increase data completeness. Um, PHS has recently had a, uh, uh, their consumer advisory group uh, meeting. They've increased uh, membership, so that seems to be going well. Their latest, uh, their latest meeting included a presentation on the accessibility survey, which we did with Ryan White Part Eight providers, and we would love to bring that here to to this group to let you know what we found out in the survey that sort of look, looks at um, different areas of accessibility for persons with disabilities. Um, I did want to underscore the news from HIV was we had a undetectable equals untransmittable uh, dance party on Sunday. Yeah, um, I was there. Uh, I went to, it was a lot of fun and uh, a really great experience. And 
one of the things that Joanne Warren said said was, uh, you know, we could hold 101 conferences and we aren't going to reach people in the same way as holding a U equals U dance party. And it was really a lot of fun. For the newer people in the room, can you explain what U equal U means? Because I'm not sure everyone's familiar with the impact statement. Sure. Undetectable equals untransmittable is a, um, a movement that's actually happening globally that recognizes that if people are have a sustained undetectable viral load, their risk to transmit the virus is next to or equal to zero. Uh, and so we really want to underscore that, celebrate that. Um, as, as a person living with HIV, you know, every every opportunity when uh, you're sexual with someone who is uh, not positive, you think about it. And it's scary. And it affects your sex life. And it's, it um, sort of affects how you relate to people. And this is a really wonderful recognition that we don't have to carry that shame and carry that stigma. So it's a really uh, wonderful time that we've arrived at this place. Thank you, Graham. I did want to mention, I'm not sure that we've talked about this here, that Graham was elected to be the chair for the Care Coalition. Yeah. Uh, he's been very busy tweeting. Um, so we want to share with you uh, so that you can follow him on, on Twitter. And it's a great way for you to connect, to connect with other advocacy efforts in the HIV community. OK, it's 4.57. Do we have any public comments? I went to the dance and released 10 years of stress. <laughs> oh, great. wow. Great. It was so beautiful. The tourists were there dancing with us, too. <laughs> it's a way to communicate effectively. And I found out a lot of people communicate, but the connect means a lot. And it's a process that we have to rethink and reframe the perception and be more diverse when it comes to addressing the community. And diversity comes from within and projected without. Thank you. More recent from GMAC. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I want to thank all the presenters today. Hold on, Jerry. Sorry, I have a lot of I have um, two things here uh, regarding about some community updates. What's happening around supervised injection facility, um, which is now supervised consumption. Um, Okay, so on Sunday, well, we, we've been starting to have discussions. We had a discussion at GMHC yesterday, which um, we're going to start trying to get more going. There's a coalition happening. Um, on Sunday, there is actually an exhibit of a mock, what uh, uh, one of these supervised um, consumption facilities would possibly look like here in New York. Um, this, it's uh, at St. Mary's Park from 12 to 4. There is, and then also they're doing discussion um, at six for at the Bronx Documentary Center at six fourteen Court and a half. I do have flyers, um, and then we are also they're doing the same thing on Monday. Of uh, what a again uh, an exhibit from one to five at City Hall Park, which is down to south of City Hall, and then there's a screening from five to eight p.m. at Cooney. Uh, City University of the Public School of Public Health at 55 125th Street. Um, I'll, I'll send out more information. Um, we have was identified the partnering. I know the Department of Health has been involved in the process of doing a feasibility study, uh, of looking at what um, the impact would be, as well as some of the fiscal cost between allowing 1,600 overdose deaths a year in New York City, plus New York City versus um, what we are doing to work as a community and building to get these up and going, because other communities are now uh, seeing an 80% reduction in overdose deaths. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. It's 5 o'clock. Um, shortly, I just wanted to thank Daniel and Carrie for their work on the community forum that we held. I'm sorry we didn't get enough time to give you a shout out for all that work. We we'll talked about it. Next week. Are we to do a journey? So moved. Thank you very much. We'll see you next month. If you need a metro card, please come see me. 
Uh, I owe Metro Cars to two of you. Thank you, Mary. 